welcome to the Fit Dads podcast. Ryan, this one's quite a heavy one today, isn't it? Yeah, you obviously mm. told me the topic and uh, what you want to discuss and mm. uh, where you want to go with this. So I'm kind of going to be, um, I guess, a little bit of a backseat. I'm let you kind of take the way and, um, yeah, take the reins of it, mate. So I really wanted to discuss grieving a parent and actually losing a parent, yeah. what that is like. I lost my dad in 2016, and obviously this being the Fit Dads podcast, mm. I thought it only fit in. Um, enough people have spoken to me about this on a separate occasion that is it a topic you'd be willing to discuss, willing to, to cover? Yeah. And it absolutely is. It's a, It's been a huge part of my own life sort of for the past eight years. So I'm, I'm really keen to discuss that first-hand experience. And this isn't a how-to, by the way. <laughs> this is a first-hand account of the things c- that can go wrong, where th- things that sort of help myself in particular, and just a bit of a perspective shift. So as morbid as it is, I, I really wanted to cover this to th- potentially help out someone who's going through it or potentially going to go through it. I think there's no one that can help people more than you. I genuinely believe that. Mm-hmm. I think um, you've seen the right people. Um, you've talked to the right professionals. And I think you're, from the conversations we've had about this, I think you're a great resource. So, yeah, I'm sure today's podcast for anyone who is grieving or is coming out the back end of grieving um, can bring a lot of value to, for sure. And it is a, it's a topic that isn't mainstream. Because like, why would it be? Let's mm. face it, you know, people, <clears throat> they grieve in private. Um, but barring a tragedy of our own demise, <laughs> we'll probably grieve one, if not both, of us parents, not to mention grandparents, who some people are equally as close to. And, and regardless of what your own relationship is like with your parent, I, I, I do genuinely believe that, you know, there's a void that's left that sort of can't be filled. Yeah. If that makes sense? It's such 100%. a there's such a formative characters and sometimes in a very negative way, sometimes in a very positive way that, you know, I just want people to reflect on their own relationship maybe with their own parents and, you know, make peace with the fact that, sorry to say this, but you will lose them one day. Yeah, you know? sure. Yeah. It's a horrible thought, isn't it? Really horrible thought to think that, you know, one day the people that you love the most, the people that you care about the most, the people that you want around for the rest of your life at some point won't be there. And um, I'll, I'll put my hands up and fully say, like, no one in my immediate circle has ever passed away. So I, I guess I'm going to mention a story today as someone that I know, mm. who probably the one that hit me the most, the hardest, I would say. Um, but aside from that, you know, my grandparents passed away when I was quite young, so you don't really understand at a, young, a really young age, like, what it's like to grieve. You just know they're not coming back, and mm. I don't think you have the emotional development to really be as affected uh, in that immediate moment Mm. but I can obviously know with you when your dad passed away it was at a very kind of you know ripe age shall we say where you are very emotional you understand Mm. the whole concept and I don't know that makes it worse or better I guess Mm. I think for just a bit of context as well like my mum and dad no still married up until my dad passed away at 54 um Weirdly, that number 54 is quite a haunting one for us as a family. Like, my granddad passed away at 54, my great-granddad passed away at 54, and so did my dad. Oh, wow. So it's quite a scary number. Um, And, yeah, it's one that we really reflected on as a family, and my dad was very aware of, unfortunately. Um, And, yeah, in 2016, he, you know, all of a sudden just took a turn in health. Uh, Started, you know... Like having a lot of health, adverse health conditions like mm. strokes, heart attacks and just out of nowhere it seemed uh, big strong fit guy I've mentioned before uh, like a bricklayer and very active and all of a sudden that just stopped just because he needed a stroke isn't something you would associate with someone who's got quite a daily active job mm. um, but yeah and, and my way of trying to deal with the grief was to understand the science a little bit like I really threw myself into it when we had the diagnosis that was cancer of an unknown primary well, right. when they found out it was cancerous, which basically means they don't know where it is. Okay. Um, we later found out it was pancreatic cancer, but, you know, post-mortem, shall we say, um, that's when we figured it out. So it, it, it was rough, really, really rough. It was a really hard time, and I said it before, I'm the eldest of three boys. Uh, I was 25 uh, when my dad passed away, so it was tough. It was really, really tough. Um, my little brothers were 21 and 16. Wow. So, 
you, you have all the the hard things to talk about. Um, you know, my dad sort of lost a little bit of cognition. There were times we were really confused. And that's really hard to see. I saw him go from this big sort of 16 stone man full of muscle to basically nine stone, just, you know, de deteriorated. And, and it is, it's a horrible thing to sort of reflect on. And I think the reason why I can talk about it so freely now is that I remember the good times. I don't, I don't dwell on the bad too much, but it's mm. incredibly traumatic to, to think about and to go through. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. I guess the worst thing about cancer as well, like you see that person not just taken away, but deteriorate like, and you can't help but know what they're going through and mm. remember that as well. Like that's a big part of their final moments. And mm. you, as much as I said, you, you know when you focus on the, the good times and the good parts mm. and the most difficult things about, I guess, grieving someone from cancer is you do know what they went through. You know mm. how difficult that moment was in their final stages. And um, yeah, hard. I, I can't, it's so hard for me to comment because I just, I have no concept of this. Mm. And my only concept is from you and other people I know who've had um, actually lost an auntie to cancer, but again, someone I wasn't relatively close with, but yeah. I did see my dad. It was his only sister. Um, mm. I did see him get quite affected by that, for sure. It's a tough one because he was by far like the, the number one bloke in your life. You know, you look up to him, you want, you want to be like him and then sort of see that turning the tables where all of a sudden we were having to care for him was was really really hard and the family dynamic just completely shifted and we all dealt with it as as own way uh, were you talking about it a lot of the time when let's say you know from the moment things started to get quite bad and you could see mm -hmm. him taking a turn were you guys quite good at talking about it or were you own were you all dealing it in your own separate ways i'd, I'd say very much his own separate ways like we we tried to be as open as possible but at the same time we had to honour what my dad wanted, which was to keep it quiet, essentially. You know, just really, he didn't want to talk about it much. No, no. That like in terms of spreading the message, he didn't want to didn't want to broadcast it to everyone. It's mm -hmm. like people who saw him in the street, for example, and you know, being pushed in the wheelchair, for example, that were a, a really yeah. humbling thing for for him and all of us, to be fair. And like you know, when that like, started affecting his eyesight, and I will tell one story in particular. Like my dad were a huge Sheffield United fan, um, and the last game we ever took him to myself and uh, my auntie who was, who was my dad's sister um, we took him to United against Oxford when we were really terrible in League One mm -hmm. we were awful and we won 4-0 but we had four goals disallowed so, oh, wow. so my dad was my dad telling everyone we won 8-0 because he, <laughs> he just had no concept that, that we'd had offsides and no matter how much I told him he's like oh, it's not six isn't it and he was keeping score like how many times the crowd cheered And so was his eyesight bad enough that he couldn't see the game uh, yeah like from okay. a distance yeah okay. and obviously the confusion were there so to my dad's knowledge the last ever United game he ever saw it was 8-0 we won 8-0 yeah brilliant love that <laughs> let's stick with that let's not change it no no let's change it let's, let's stick with that um, but I think the hard bit is I got to say everything that I wanted to say to him but the best bit is that the best bit is I got to say everything that I wanted to say to him yeah so like you really, you really think about that you think like well what do I want to tell my dad and uh which is so hard at your mm. age. Like, you know, obviously you were the oldest of three, but yeah. anything below the age of like 30, really, I guess, even maybe higher, like, how do you mm. comprehend what's about to happen? How do you vocalize for the final time what you want to say to mm. your dad? Like, you don't, I guess. You no. just, you just there, you're present, you're making sure every moment matters. Mm. And um, yeah, just complete perspective shift, I yeah. guess. The hardest thing you ever said, like the hardest thing I've ever heard personally, is when he said that he'd never meet his grandkids. Like that, that to this day still still really hurts me. The mm. fact that he he was very cognizant of that, he was very aware that that had never happened. Yeah. Uh, and Teddy, like his middle name's Robert after my dad's, and mm. you know that that felt felt right to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What yeah. a great way of like yeah. um, you know remember, remembering him, and he would have loved that as well. Mm. He loved that. That's how Teddy introduces himself, by the way. He'll tell you he's Teddy Robert. Teddy Robert, yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah, he'll tell you yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Which, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. Like my way of dealing with that process in particular was to dive into the weeds of it, you know, to understand what was going on, to dive into the science. When they told us about palliative care, which is a really terrible word well, when you first hear it, which basically means end of life care, I was completely, uh, I suppose, defiant towards that word. I was like, no, 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 we're gonna we're gonna fix this we're going to get it right. Mm. Forget palliative care. We don't need it. 
And I, I genuinely believed it to the point where you have this like crushing belief that you can fix it, which is really hard because I think we all went through different stages and that was mine. And my dad always told me to like, let's explore some options, you know, don't lose belief in it. And for, for him to say that when, you know, I think he knew that as soon as it was palliative, like that's end of life care, you know, yeah. but he always encouraged me to that. believe that we could find something. What which, a nice thing, and you know, yeah. even what from what he, because he probably know them, he probably knew the most. Let's be honest, because mm. you know he loved been talking to the doctors quite closely. Yeah, and again, it's how you approach that as someone who's going through that. You know, you don't want to scare your family, you don't want your family to change, you don't want you, you don't really want your life to change. Like I guess even though you're going through this, mm. you don't want to be known as associated with that guy who's got cancer now yeah. and is you know going through final stages of life because everyone is going to act differently mm. you probably want your final stages to be the happy times the, yeah. the, the great times and um you're going to appreciate life a lot more mm. but you also you know you don't want that stigma around mm. that label that, that's the c word i think one thing that you i suppose forget about is that the people who care for the people affected if that makes sense mm. so i've been with amy for a long time my now wife um, and she, you know, she knew my dad since, you know, since she was fifteen, essentially. Uh, so she'd known him for ten years as well. And mm-hmm. uh, Hannah, my, my now sister-in-law, um, you know, she supported my little brother through it. But my mum as well. Like, you know, my mum had to try and, you know, abide my dad's wishes and support uh, the family and sort of try and keep it afloat and yeah. and still, you know, grieve a husband essentially. Yeah. So it, it would it would an impossible situation that you have to really I think it really highlights that how important the women are in all this yeah. like the, the, the girls men are just like we're complex emotionally and, mm. and also very simple at the same time yeah but I think we find it very hard to express things and talk about it we we you know as we know in from the mental health crisis that's going on today we bottle things up and we don't talk about it and mm. we deal with it in our own very unique specific way and I think there's I, I know it's from I've spoken about it before but my way of dealing with things is just get through it like I don't I don't want to burn anyone with my yeah. my shit basically if I'm going through something like I don't want to put on someone else like that's yeah. the last thing I want I want to get through it I'll come out and, I, and I'm quite optimistic about the fact that I will come out at the mm. end of it yeah but often sometimes more often than not you won't yeah you have to speak to people the only way to release that tension mentally yeah. is talking it really is I suppose changing on to like towards the end for my dad like the two most overwhelming things that I've ever had to do and I'll go on record saying this is choosing my dad's coffin which were again really grim and, and, and a horrible thing to do but you know I wanted to be a part of that naively um, do you is any part of you regrets that or not oh no it were lovely red white and black you know was it? Yeah, yeah, themed. Class, yeah of course class, it were nice bit of gold on there awesome um not seeing much of that nowadays. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're not now. And then, uh, and then, literally at his funeral, it's the most overwhelmed that I've ever been. Like there were so many people there, and mm. people my dad used to tell me stories about. Yeah. You know, I, I talked to them in the pub afterwards, and he I was la- this, and I yeah. were laughing, yeah. and I'm thinking, yeah. my dad would have loved this, and I'm like, well, <laughs> it's yeah. too late I'm, for that I'm, now. I'm enjoying this, but also, <clears throat> I wish he was here with us to celebrate this. Uh, there's a picture with me and a couple of my mates from football and like we're in the pub all suited and booted from a from a funeral and we're smiling mm. and I, I, I look back at that picture and I still feel really guilty about that yeah. even though I, them smiles were genuine I meant it yeah. like I, I were happy to hear my, hear people's memories of my dad and yeah. but then I, everything quietens down after the funeral you know people get on with their lives that's not the most important mm. thing anymore for Essentially, for other people, you know, you can't. If the world stopped every time somebody yeah. somebody passed away, we'd never get going again. So yeah. that was the hard bit that that I found just getting started yeah, again. Yeah. Yeah. To the point where, when I dived into the science behind it, <clears throat> this is where I do get quite nerdy now. Um, I realised that grief comes with quite a strong motivational response, which is you're very aware of your own mortality, if you like. So I threw myself into work. I did nothing else but work for about. Mm. six months and my dad passed away in November 2016 and I was getting married in September 2017 so I I knew that you know I wanted to work hard I wanted to sort of distract myself and uh, Amy had to cope with that if you know what I mean and I, I told this story before but I, I chased a big bonus at work um, in my old job uh, I got it and I thought I'll solve a lot of that you know 
a couple of grand in my bank, that'll mm. be all right. And mm. I felt nothing when it landed. And yeah. I thought, this is bad. Like, yeah. This didn't solve anything? No. And it was no. what you were working towards? Yeah. And deep down, I sort of thought, yeah, that'll solve a lot of problems. So we we booked to go away on holiday um, like before his wedding, which was quite a nice position to be in. And yeah, just sort of broke down from there. Like really went a bit numb to everything. Um, I've not actually asked him if I can share this story, but I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> which she asked me, she's like, do you even want to get married? And I went, I don't know. She went like, do you even love me? And I says, I don't know. Like, I didn't feel anything. I just felt completely mm. like dead inside. Um, and that were hard. Um, I saw an amazing like analogy with it. It's like you're, you're trying to reach for a glass of water, but every time you reach for it, it just moves further away. That, that's how it felt. It felt like I could, I, I could never get what I wanted. And you think, well, what, what do I do now? Like, yeah. And, uh, and that's when Amy sort of brought up uh, like potentially some counselling just to get my head out of it and mm-hmm. just to understand what's going on. Was that, was that the lowest moment? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, by far. By far. There were a time where just having that conversation with Amy saying, I don't know. And uh, of course I know, like, you know, she's, she's my now wife, mother of my child, and I'd have been so silly just to throw everything away then for the sake of self-destruction, essentially. Yeah. So I didn't want to do that. Wanted to wanted to fix it and be right for people so I could, you know, move forward with my life and I suppose in, enjoy my wedding, you know, that were obviously going to be quite emotionally charged, but... Yeah. Must be really hard for you, obviously, no no doubt about it, like, for you, but also for Amy as well, like, mm. for that whole thing, because it's, you know what it's like for a woman, like, her, one of the most special times in her life is her wedding day, mm. and they run up to that, planning yeah. it, prepping it, having yeah. everyone around her, really positive, and then, obviously, <laughs> that negative spin, I guess, of what's been, what's just happened. Yeah. But also... On the flip side, she knows she's going to be there for you. Mm. She knows she's going to be there for everyone else in the family because if she knows the family really well, she's probably thinking, I've got to support everyone here as well. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really good in that moment that you were very honest with her as well. Like, you weren't sure what you wanted. Like, you weren't sure that whether you want... But I, th- I think deep down you probably knew you wanted all the things that she wanted. Mm. You just didn't have any emotion left to give. Yeah. You had no emotion for love or mm. for grief or for anything like you were just probably emotionally drained and I would yeah. imagine that came out in that conversation where she was asking these quite hard questions like do you mm. want to get married do you still love me and you, you don't know in that moment you don't you don't know what you want like you just mm. I don't know I'm trying to think of any relatable moments I've had but I can't really and mm. I think you just yeah I guess it's all very confusing at that time oh yeah I, th- I think I just wanted to feel something which is why I threw myself into work. Like I wanted that sense of achievement, but I threw myself into training as well. Like looked great, but it weren't worth it. You know, mm. I, I, I think it were. I'm not going to say a form of self harm, but you, you know, you push yourself to a no, degree. I think it is. I think yeah, one hundred percent. It's yeah, like yeah. It, you, you, you mentioned the word distraction before. It's yeah, definitely distraction. There's oh, no yeah. doubt about that. But I think it is. It's a, it's a certain sense of punishment, and I can definitely recount times in my youth where. I used the gym to punish myself. Mm. I remember one time, just it sounds very mm. insignificant now, but just splitting up with an ex girlfriend and feeling really terrible about the whole thing. Yeah. And I just I just punished myself in the gym. Mm. I really, really to the point where it was like not healthy and good and you know, you do it out of reaction for something quite bad in your life and you mm. know, it's very understandable as to why you went down that path for sure. So when I sort of see people now or work with people now who are maybe maybe training for the wrong reasons, I'm like I'm super aware of it because I've I've been there, I've done it. It's it's a terrible place to be because again you just want to feel something or distract yourself from what you're feeling. And, and in my case, it was just to feel something, mm. which you know in that case was pain, but it was it was still a feeling. You know? It's a really poignant quote that yeah. just I just wanted to feel something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. big time because you just numb to the whole thing. Big time, and uh, mm. I suppose the. Yeah, the, the the main motivators for that were Amy, my mum, my my two brothers, Billy and Bobby. Like, because I, I didn't want to look like I would, you know, stepping up to be dad. If you know what I mean, I knew that they there's had to a do huge it self. That those thoughts obviously were in your mind. There's a yeah. huge pressure then to like, right? I essentially am the man of the house now. Like, mm-hmm. I'm I'm the person. I'm the eldest person yeah. in my family, mm-hmm. and as a male, I need to go and maybe 
I don't know, fulfil certain roles. Um, but did you ever feel any pressure in terms of that aspect of things? For myself, like there were times where I thought, well, how can I talk to my mum about this? Yeah. Because she's lost a life partner. Like I can still go off and do things, yeah. you know, with with my life partner. And and how do I talk to my brothers about that? Because I need to be, you know. The, you you kind of need to be the one they talk to, I guess. Yeah, that's how I felt anyway. And I, I talk to them now and, you know, they always say to me like, no, we don't want you feeling like that. We want you to know that you can come to us, which is which is amazing of them. But I, I, need, I think I needed to speak to someone who didn't know my dad, which was hard sometimes because he was, he was really, you know, he's a popular guy. He knew yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. So I just needed to talk to someone who didn't know him and didn't have any judgment. And Why do you think speaking to someone who didn't know him would help? I suppose it was the the lack of opinion, if that makes sense. Okay. Like because people, I didn't want the sympathy. Like yeah. I want, I wanted to solve it. Like I wanted to, like get over this now. Yeah. And that sounds quite harsh to say to myself, but I thought, right, I need, I need mechanisms to cope with this now. I didn't have any. Because when would, you, because when if a, if a third person comes in and they know you, they know yeah. your dad, mm. they've been friends with them, there's a relationship, <clears throat> they're immediately coming into this conversation potentially to try and help you from a very emotional point of view mm. they're not looking at the nuts and bolts of how to move you forward they're just being sometimes you, sympathy isn't what you need you yeah. need real like clinical help sometimes and I mm. think I'm hoping you're going to tell me that's where the counsellor was really good and it yeah. sounds like they've done a pretty good job in terms of mm. resetting a few things they were brilliant and uh, I don't know if I can shout her out I don't know how like you know uh how do I say it? Mainstream uh, she wants to be. Yeah, I mean, I'll not Public. just in case. Yeah, I'll yeah. not just okay. in case. Okay. But, but no, I think for me it was really important to to go through that, and uh, we built a really good relationship. Like we went through Cavendish Cancer Care, who were they're a charity. You know, mm -hmm. they offer free counselling sessions for anyone affected by cancer. Yeah. And uh, the more that I realised that, I thought, well, I have been affected by cancer, and yeah, why shouldn't I have this support? And then I I went actually to the centre to to have my counselling and I sat there and there were three people in like um, what do you call them like the bandanas where, they, where they'd been through treatment and you could see they had no hair like no eyebrows no nothing oh wow I'm sat there thinking what am I doing here so they were giving counselling to people who actually had cancer yeah but the service obviously expanded to <clears throat> to family and people like that and I thought what on earth am I doing here so you felt like a fraud anyway. yeah. Yeah. yeah which you definitely shouldn't have oh I felt horrendous and that's the first thing I said to uh, to my counsellor I was just like I, I feel like I shouldn't be here like mm. obviously with context but I'm like <laughs> I feel like what, what am I doing in this building like yeah. this feels horrendous and uh, she said no you're entitled to this help just as much as them because you can mm. you can help people and uh, I'll probably go on to say like after a fair few sessions like you know we bounced a few thought thought processes off and she just listened like she listened Brilliant. prompted me with the right questions and the, the harshest thing anyone's ever said to me I, I think I said to I said to the counsellor, I'm like, how long am I going to feel like this? And they went, how long's your dad not going to be here for? And that was like mm. the harshest thing anyone's ever said to me, but mm. it worked. And she, they said it in such like a loving way, in terms of well, you're always going to feel like this. And she, they used like this wave analogy, which was incredible. They sort of said like, when you're grieving, it's like standing in the sea. Sometimes it like laps at your feet, and it's quite nice. Like you remember all, all pleasant memories. Other times waves get a bit bigger, like they knock you off balance a little bit. And other times they're just just over your head. Like, yeah. you know, you're out, you know, you cast out to sea. I love just, that. I love just, that analogy. That's brilliant. I just thought it was brilliant and I thought, yeah, okay. So I'll regularly ask that, like, where what's what's the water like? Mm. I'll I'll ask that sometimes, you know, if I'm feeling a certain way, I'll be like, right, how how choppy's the water mm. today? Mm. You know, how bad are the waves? And I just thought it was such a cool cool thing for them to say. It's really well put and it's very mm -hmm. apt, isn't it? Because, yeah, it does It does come in waves like when you grieve someone. Like I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll tell a story about I had a client who passed away, um, an old client. She uh, was a teacher and she just fell ill one day and wasn't feeling right and got rushed to hospital and unfortunately, you know, um, she never left and um, I've never had anyone close to me pass away, touch wood, you know, um, mm -hmm. but... This was one that really affected me. I'm thinking for, for weeks and weeks afterwards, I was thinking about this one. And mm. she was a, a lovely, lovely girl. Did, achieved a, a fantastic, um, you know, 
transformation here and she was she was really hard working and um caught up with me occasionally on instagram as well would ask me questions about things that she was getting up to and tips and just one of those people that just i love checking in with and um i can't remember how i found out i think it was um it was actually i followed her partner on instagram and i think i saw him post something <coughs> that suggested that something had happened <coughs> and then i messaged um i actually messaged i'd actually coached some other people that she knew and I messaged them and said mm. um, I'm worried about Steph you know can you just give me some information mm. they unfortunately told me that um, this is the case and this is what's happened and, um, yeah I, I'm, I'm not a very emotional person but that was the first time in a while I'd, uh, yeah. I'd shed a tear yeah. Uh, and yeah cause it's, it stuck me for a good few weeks but yeah I, I can't imagine what that's like tenfold and it did. It did kind of come in very, obviously, very, very small waves in terms mm. of where I wouldn't, you wouldn't think about. It, you get on your day to day thing, the yep. distractions. But then I remember, I remember the shower being one moment where I'd always, I was thinking about it a lot. Like I was just yeah. stood in the shower, and you, your thoughts are blank, your mind's blank. You're doing a very mundane task that you do every day, and it was in that moment that I was just like, shit, mm. and I'd start thinking about it. And um, I'm sure I'm not sure if you've had the same thing, whether it was like certain moments in the day or mm. certain tasks that you were doing that maybe reminded you or brought to the forefront those thoughts of your dad. But I, I, I found that. Yeah, I think for me it were like the questions that I wanted to ask him. For example, like one thing I don't publicly speak about too often is I want to call it like a relapse, where basically when Teddy was born, I like spiraled again. Really? Just yeah, apparently it's quite common in uh, you've lost a parent, like you have your own child, and it's like a trigger. Um, it weren't immediate don't get me wrong but there were times where I thought I ain't got a clue what I'm doing here like I asked my dad and I remember the times where like I picked my phone up because yeah. I just forgot yeah. and I like, sat on my phone and like went to go and press dial and I thought well I can't do that anymore yeah. so you'd, you'd spiral that way and that was like the second round that I went for a counselling which I, I really needed by the way like that was quite bad was it, was it worse than the first time do you think? I'd say so yeah because I felt the first time I could, it sort of felt like I did need it I was like, no, this is justified. But I'm like, well, what am I doing? Like, mm. well, why am I doing this? Like, I've just had a, an amazing little boy. Like, yeah. why on earth am I going through this again? And it just felt like I didn't necessarily deserve it that time. That's where I like, talked myself out of it and were like, this, no, this is not grief. No, I'll, I'll get on with it because you know, I've got these coping strategies and it's different with a kid, you know. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine that as well, yeah. You know, like all those moments where <coughs> your first natural reaction is like, what did my parents do with me? Can I talk to them about this? And then realising mm. that that's not an option anymore. I can totally, totally see why that would be a really, really triggering mm. moment in your life. Um, was it something that the council mentioned the first time or was it something you heard kind of afterwards? The, I reached out to them again, actually being like, listen, I need some help. Like, I'm willing to pay. And they're like, no, you are actually entitled to as many rounds as you need. Right. And that, that amazed me, to be honest. And that's when I sort of turned on to... I suppose charity charity work for them, which, yeah. which I still do now because just to pay them back. Yeah, you know yeah literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how good it's been. Oh yeah, and I think it's nice to know that you've paid back your own sessions tenfold. Yeah, you know that's that's quite a nice feeling yeah, to be like I've put either many other people through that, which is nice. One hundred percent. But no, the key thing that they said to me is like, well, what would your dad say to that question? And I could answer it quite accurately. I'm like, well, he'd tell me to do this. Yeah. And I remember him saying like, I asked for the same counselor by the way because they were still there, thankfully. Right. Um, even like three three years later three years later yeah wow. and uh, and they said to me they were like look y- you can still talk to your dad and they were like pulling a face being like come on mm-hmm. not sign me up to any say on stuff but <laughs> and they did they like that's you can, a little Ouija board out uh, or something yeah. and they said like you can still talk to him because you know what he'd say uh, proper like Lion King moment you know like yeah, mm, okay. he's, he's there. Okay, and I'm like, yeah, I do actually know what he's saying. His face in the clouds. That's it. Still looking <laughs> a little puddle of water. <laughs> but no, that's what they said. They were like, look, you, you know what he'd say, don't you? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do. It's like, so you can still talk to him, can't you? I'm like, yeah, you just can't talk back. Yeah, but I, I know what he'd say. I know like the tone that he'd say it. Uh, I like that. It's it's it's, it's well yeah. put that without making it sound a bit childish and foolish. Like it's just, yeah. yeah what would he say? Because most of the time, mm. you know, I guess when it's like kids as well because you've yeah. been one you, you know what he said to you and yeah. it's rem- almost like remembering a little bit from when you were a child I guess I, I, I think for me personally when I had Ted like I linked the connected to the dots as well like I was 29 my dad was 29 when he had me he's a, no he's my son like the eldest son so so deep down for me I sort of I thought 
God, my dad, my dad went through everything mm. exactly the same, and I can't even ask him anymore. Yeah. So that that were tough. That were really tough. But you know, we, we try his best with Ted, and yeah, still can't watch Lion King though. Can you not? Nah, it's not game, over, game over. Game over. Is it? Yeah, oh, no. can't do that. No really? chance. You not seen the new one? Uh, have you watched it? I think I watched it through like my hands. Like, Did you? Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like covered yeah, my ears yeah. sometimes. But yeah, I remember even when I was a kid when I used to watch Lion King. It being even at the age of like you know five, six, it being quite emotional. Um, mm. But that's the one where I guess anything where there's that really strong bond between two characters who are father and son. Mm. It's always gonna be tough watch, yeah. I guess. But um, you know, it sounds like you've really come at the end in an amazing way. And, just to be, just, and, and actually know how difficult this is for you to sit down here and talk about it today. So mm. um, I think it just shows where your head's at with it all. And coming back to what we started at the start, I, the, I guess one of the main things about this episode was can we pass it forward? Mm. Or can, I say we, can you pass it forward? Because you obviously, you know, yeah. the person who's got all the insights there. And again, like enough people have approached me about it, which has surprised me actually. I didn't, I didn't realise it was a topic people would like a little bit more uh, I suppose information on mm. but like, if, if this helps anybody amazing um, ideally I would like this to be quite proactive for people you know where maybe you listen to it and you think right where am I at like with my relationships what's what and don't get me wrong it could be fully justified that you know you could have had a huge fallout justifiably with, with your parent but you know just remember that not going to be here for, like forever 100% <laughs> yeah. yeah perspective yeah. episode absolutely and I, I suppose one of the tangible was just life insurance. I had no life insurance up until like my dad passed away, and then that triggered me to really get some life insurance. Yeah, yeah. 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 Especially the age I was at, I thought, oh. right, let's go. Was was that because you were thinking about what your dad did? Did he? I mean, did he have life insurance? That what was that what triggered it? Yeah, yeah. As far as I'm aware, he, he, he did, and that's one thing that I've said to my mum. Like, look, I'm here if you want to discuss anything like that. But mm. she's been pretty good in that sense that you know yeah. she's she not burden us with that sort of stuff um, but I remember that was one thing for me it just triggered in my mind I'm like right I need life insurance um, begrudgingly I've still not done a will because <laughs> it's quite a morbid thing to do but yeah, yeah. yeah again that's something that I've just prompted myself to do mm. that's something Amy's been mentioning a little bit recently actually Amy, Amy's gone down this kind of morbidity chat recently yeah. where she's like what if we what, what if we both pop our clothes tomorrow mm. who gets high well who looks after her yeah. who gets the stuff we own who gets anything basically mm. rather than you know families fighting over things and there's always potential for that I think if, if you've got a will it makes it a lot easier mm. for everyone and um, then your wishes are kind of being passed forward I guess yeah definitely and it is it's quite a a hard thing to discuss with your partner as well because like, when do you discuss that like you just bring it up and be like let's talk about life insurance and then you're on you know <laughs> On internet booking a skydive, do you know what I mean? Don't don't yeah. do it that way. <laughs> but, <let's laughs> Please don't, don't book do that. a skydive after you've done your Yeah, work. don't do that. Which uh, <laughs> How did but you no, jump from that to that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But no, there is there's a there's a way to do it and yeah, just like people a lot of people put off by this conversation and rightfully so, it shouldn't be at the front of your mind, it should be the back of your mind. But mm. you know, there will be times where you you know, it pops into your head and you go, actually, what am I sweating this small stuff for? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's, there's people who are struggling every day and, you know, don't let it control you. Mm. And I think one thing that this whole, I mean, just since knowing you and since knowing your backstory with your dad and everything, it really highlights for me that it actually doesn't matter how healthy you are, really, mm. let's be honest. doesn't matter. Mm. Like, there is no right, wrong, life isn't, it just isn't fair. Like, you know what I mean? In, in every aspect and every level, life isn't fair. We just do things that we think are good for us. We we exercise and we train and we eat better because we feel like those things will improve not only how we feel but our longevity of life and mm. our quality of life. But it's um, you know it, it holds no prisoners, does it? You know, the cancer and um, the, there's some shocking, shocking stats. Like, is it one in two people will get it? Mm -hmm. um, which is madness. Like one of us, potentially yeah. in our lifetime, could get it. Mm -hmm. Which is which is just a frightening thought. Um, but again, just, just do all the right things you can. Set yourself up from a, a will point of view, a life insurance point of view. Um, I never would have got those things sorted if it weren't for my mortgage advisor. Actually, um, I have to shout out uh, her out because 
she, when we got the mortgage and, uh, and the, our very first mortgage, she had a few other things that she was, I think, were upsells really. Yeah. But one of them was life insurance, and it mm. was, um, it's been, it's, it's almost like a peace of mind. Like I actually do think about it sometimes. Yeah. I might see that little kind of thing come up and bank balance. So what's that thought? Uh, mm. Okay, that's the life insurance. I'm like, actually, yeah, I can, if, I, if I pop my clock tomorrow, like Amy's, she'll do all right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's quite like a, a reassuring thought in a way. Really, really reassuring. Yeah. Really reassuring. Yeah, for mm. sure. Um, not that I'll tell her that much because yeah, I don't, <laughs> don't want to plant any seeds in her mind. There is that. She's booking a skydive, mate, next week. Get ready for that. Is your theatre? It's my birthday in two weeks. If, I, if, I, if I get a skydive, I'll know what's what. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be checking that parachute <laughs> twice. Yeah, should have listened to this, mate. But yeah. yeah. No, I, I do think with people, like, it is important to have them chats with your significant others and look, just try and make it a little bit more not normal as such. You don't want to be like, mm. you don't want to walk in after you've eaten tea and be like, well, yeah. we're going to die one day, you know. But talk about normalising, yeah. again, just the whole conversation of, of grief itself, you know, should be more normal. Mm. But I totally appreciate that people in those first few moments don't want to talk about it. You just need to process it yourself. Mm. You need to go away, work out how you're going to get through this emotionally and then maybe start opening up down the line. Mm. But it's vital that down the line you do start that process um 100 and like i said i did dive like dive into books and research and that sort of stuff just because i'm just a massive nerd like that i wanted to know what was going on in my head and i think the author was a guy called scott peck i think it is and he was fantastic like i've read a few of his books now they're very deep like heavy books and one of the books where he talks about grief sort of ended with i'll never forget the sentence it basically said now go and live a life for the two of you, which I thought were really cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah, that stuck with me quite yeah. heavily. Yeah, because then you live in exactly how he would want you to live, mm. how you want to live, and you remembering him as well. Yeah, definitely. Beautiful. It's really well put. So yeah, mate. I'm sorry. It's been a little bit of a heavy one, and this was my idea, by the way. So Ryan's not forced me into a corner with this <laughs> <laughs> right Brad this week it's the big one I'm putting you on the spot mate no it was um, it was something when we started the podcast we wrote down some episodes and things that we thought might be good topics and um, you this was one of your immediate ones wasn't it it was, mm. it was discussing the grief side of things because it's a huge yeah. part of your story and it's you know as much as like you might see it as a scar scars give us character scars make us who we are their stories and you might not be the person you are today in so many respects if it wasn't for what you've been through. So we always tend to focus on the negative side of this stuff, but actually they can make you a lot stronger in the long run. Mm. So, um, you know, don't shy away from them. Talk about your kind of your, your grief, talk about things you're going through, talk about your mental health, because um, if you get past those things, it's amazing how much stronger you can be in the long run, for sure. And I will go on record by saying that I'll always make time for people. Like if they pull me to one side and have a chat like clients or if I get a sporadic message on social media if ever I post something about my dad like I like knowing where people are at I like knowing mm -hmm. just if you can help them point them in the right direction and just people knowing that there's, a, there's opportunities out there to not do it on your own yeah mm. I think you know I would massively back that up if, if there's anyone I know who's going to give you the best help with this it's Brad because not only is he in an industry where his job is to help people but he also gets it. He's got first-hand experience. So, yeah, if anyone's struggling in any capacity, Brad, your man, for sure, absolutely reach out to him. And hopefully, yeah, hopefully this does help people, just whether proactively or reactively, whether they're going through it or bracing themselves to go through it, which is a couple of people I've spoken to recently who the parents are in a, in a bad state. Mm. So almost preparing himself for that. Yeah. Because, yeah, I, I wish somebody would have told me this before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That must be really hard as well, seeing people, especially that you know, go through mm. the same thing. Do you find that triggering at all? Do you find that that brings up some old memories or are you okay with it now? I think I'm okay with it now, but just like anything, it depends how how big the waves are. Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, mm. um, yeah guys, um, thank you for joining us on this episode. Um, hopefully you got a lot from it. And um, just to reiterate, if you want to reach out to Brad, um, his... Um, Username on Instagram is at Thompson Training underscore at Thompson Training. Cool. We've also got the uh, we'll put the email in the show notes today. Mm -hmm. So if you want to reach out to Brad for that, 
um, in that way you can. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for joining. Thank you.